We come now to the final video in the Peloponnesian War. Yes, we finally, finally made it. And when I started recording these lectures, I didn't think I would do 15 videos of the Peloponnesian War. But it is a very, very important topic in the history of ancient Greece. And so that is that, as they say. Now, we left off with the Athenian victory at the Battle of Arginusae. And then the Athenians outrageously decided to put eight of their generals on trial, mainly because of the failure to rescue survivors. And so this trial was similar to one of those Soviet show trials in the 1930s. It was very very, very political. Now, I don't want to imply that the decision was unanimous. It certainly was not. In fact, there was a very sizable faction in the assembly that defended these generals. And actually, they survived the first vote. But there was another vote, and they were found guilty. And as we know now, six of the eight generals were executed, and the other two were driven into exile. And so now the Athenians lacked quality military leadership. There were two notable survivors. Conan and Thrasybulus. Now, as we know, Conan was not present at the Battle of Arginusae itself. He was defending the Athenian garrison at Mytilene, and so again, he survived this purge. Thrasybulus was present at the Battle of Arginusae, and he actually was one of the generals tasked with rescuing survivors. And so it's interesting that he was not even brought to trial, and he also again survived this purge, and both he and Conan will play a role in Athens after the Peloponnesian War. Now, as we talked about in the last video, Lysander had to step down from command after his year was up as Navarch of the Spartan fleet. And that was a law, and that was the requirement. But after Arginusai, the Peloponnesian navy clearly needed Lysander back. And so they decided to bend the rules a little bit, as the cliche goes. And what the Spartans did here is that they made Lysander the deputy of the new Navarch. Now, this was in name only. It was Lysander who was really in control of the fleet, and he wielded the real power here. Now, Lysander quickly made some important decisions. He moved the Peloponnesian naval base back to Ephesus, where it belonged in the first place. And the Persians this time actually made Lysander a satrap, which gave the Peloponnesians access to more money, which allowed Lysander to, yet again, rebuild the battered Spartan fleet. And so, again, it is that Persian money that plays a very, very important role in the eventual success of the Peloponnesian Navy. Now, once he felt comfortable, Lysander began to raid Athenian possessions in the Aegean. And everything ended up in the Hellespont yet again. It could only end there, right? In the Hellespont, where most of the key battles had taken place in the last several years. Now, with Lysander back in the Hellespont, Athenian commerce was once again threatened, and the Athenian navy at Samos sailed out to find and destroy Lysander's naval forces. Now, in the Hellespont, the Peloponnesian navy set up at their usual base in Abydos, and then Lysander seized the strategically important town of Lampsacus, which is right here on the map, and that threatened the Bosphorus itself. Now, the Athenians sailed to their usual base at Sestos. After this, the Athenians sailed to Egospotami, and this would allow the Athenians to keep a watchful eye on Lysander. Now, after that, the Athenians, almost on a daily basis, would sail right up to the harbor where Lysander was located at Lampacus. And so they were trying to get Lysander to come out and fight. But Lysander refused, realizing that time was on his side, and that he had lots of money, while the Athenians had little. In fact, the Athenians had to melt down several of their priceless statues just to keep their fleet in operation. Now, almost unbelievably, Alcibiades appeared on the scene. And apparently, from one of his many numerous estates, he had been watching this daily standoff and decided to enter the Athenian camp. He advised the Athenian generals to move back to Sestos because Sestos had a harbor and that would give the Athenians a safety net, safety from a potential sneak attack by Lysander. He also requested a command of one of the squadrons. Now, this might have been a good idea by the Athenians to give him a command, but technically Alcibiades was still a condemned man, condemned by the Athenian assembly. And so his offer was refused and he was quickly escorted out of the Athenian camp. Now, these cat and mouse games went on and on as the Athenians continued to dare Lysander to come out and fight outside of his harbor. Now, these delays caused the Athenians to get lazy, and inactivity will do that to any army. 
And so since nothing was happening day after day, the Athenians began to think Lysander would never come out of the harbor. And in fact, Lysander was setting up an elaborate trap. Because if the Athenians thought nothing would happen day after day, this would set up a scenario where Lysander could launch a surprise attack. And that's what led to the Battle of Egospotami. Now, there are two different versions of this battle. Diodorus relates that the Athenians sent out an advance squadron, hoping yet again to lure Lysander out of his harbor. And this advance squadron was defeated, and the rest of the fleet was annihilated on the beach. Now, remember, the Athenians were not at Sestos, and so they did not have their natural defensive harbor during this battle. And that was the very thing that Alcibiades had warned the Athenian commanders of. Now, Xenophon's account is a little bit different. He has the entire Athenian fleet setting sail and Lysander again remaining in the harbor. But when the Athenians returned to their beaches, Lysander launched a sneak attack and captured most of the Athenian ships on the beachhead. But both accounts are similar in one respect. The Athenians lost almost their entire fleet. And with that, the Athenians no longer had enough money to construct another fleet and that effectively meant the war was over. And with their victory at Egospotami, the Peloponnesian navy was free to rampage throughout the Aegean, and the Athenians could not stop them. City after city after city fell to the Spartans, with eventually only Samos as the lone holdout. But even Samos was eventually compelled to surrender. And with that, the Spartans were able to finally target Athens itself. Two Spartan armies camped outside the Athenian long walls, and there was no hope for the Athenians. Despite this, the Athenians refused to surrender, and part of the problem was the fact that the Athenians were worried that their city would be utterly annihilated if they surrendered. And so that led to a fierce debate about what to do with Athens. Corinth and Thebes wanted Athens destroyed altogether. But there were some moderate Spartans that proposed that, that only the Long Wall should be destroyed, but Athens itself would be saved. This basically meant that Athens would retain control over Attica, but would lose control over her overseas possessions. The circumstances were in Athens' favor. Sparta began to fear the rising power of Thebes. And as I mentioned a few videos ago, Thebes was one of the few cities that actually benefited from the Peloponnesian War. They were getting stronger and stronger throughout the war. Now, if Sparta destroyed Athens, that would only make it easier for Thebes to dominate Attica. And since Sparta had control over Greece, the last thing they wanted was another competitor. And so the decision was made to save Athens. And once that was conveyed to the Athenians themselves, the assembly voted to accept Sparta's terms and the war finally came to an end. I'd like to offer some final thoughts on the Peloponnesian War. It has often been called the greatest war in Greek history and the worst war in Greek history. And I think that idea applies. And the war took a darker side in many respects. Women and children were sold into slavery and even sometimes tossed into the sea. Terrible things were done to captives. And I'm not suggesting that this hadn't been done before, but throughout the Peloponnesian War, it seemed to become the norm. And so that was a change in the way the Greeks conducted themselves in the course of this war. Now, Sparta itself changed as well. Now, from about the time of Lycurgus, the Spartans were forbidden from having a fleet. Now they possessed a fleet. And now they were taking over cities and demanding tributes in the same way that the Persians and Athenians had. And so this would create a lot of resentment going forward. And that is something we will talk about at length in the next several videos. Okay, that is going to do it for the Peloponnesian War. I will see you guys in the next video.